Hey y'all, welcome back to Tobacco Leaf Legacies. I'm Cheryl. Welcome to another installment of Brew and Review. Today, we are going to be reviewing Madeline Langle's An Acceptable Time. Now, some of you <clears throat> might be familiar with Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time. Not that we're going to spend a whole lot of time talking about that book, but that was actually the first book of Madeline's that I read. And I read it in fifth grade. We did a little report on it, the whole thing. And I really liked that story. It was time travel, a little bit sciencey, but it was it was really a very cool story. <clears throat> now, that first one, A Wrinkle in Time, was published in 1962. I found out when I was doing a little bit of research about Madeline that Wrinkle in Time, An Acceptable Time, and there's three other ones that are in between. So it's actually a series of five books. That first one, A Wrinkle in Time, was published in 1962. This one was published in 1989. So between the five books, there was 27 years between them. Are you, have you ever been working on a book, think it's taken you forever? 27 years for her to do five. So, I mean, you know, keep going. <laughs> okay, let's talk about, oh, and let me say too, when I got this book, because we heard me mention in the other one, the place that I love to go and support the family um, with their small business and all that, I did not know that it was a series of books. I just saw this, saw the cover, saw Madeline and went, ooh, Madeline Langle. Oh, I liked her. I liked that first book. So let's grab it. Found out later there's actually three others in between, but that's okay. Okay, so talking about a little bit about A Wrinkle in Time in here. A Wrinkle in Time introduces us to the Murray family. Um, I always, always have my little notes. Uh, Alex is the father. He is a physicist. Kate is the mother. She is a microbiologist. They had four children. Meg, who was the main character of A Wrinkle in Time, Charles, and twins, Sandy and Denny's. Now, later in the series, in the other books that I have not read yet, Meg marries her friend Calvin O'Keefe, who is also in A Wrinkle in Time, and they have seven kids. The eldest is Polly. Polly is the main character in this book. And the grandparents, well, they're grandparents now, but Alex and Kate, who were the main parents in the first one, they're the grandparents in this one. So I think that's kind of cool how we've kind of continued with that family. Okay, let's talk about Madeline Langle for a minute. When I was doing some reading and researching for the book, I thought, well, let me look up a bit about her. Okay, now she was both a Christian and very interested in science. And it's very evident when you read her books, how she kind of splices those two together, which I think is very interesting. As a side note, I'm always very fascinated with when you've caught shows that talk about looking for the Ark of the Covenant, looking for these kinds of very biblical things and trying to use science in order to find them. And I just, I always think that blend is pretty interesting. So Madeline's maternal grandfather, I thought this was interesting, was Florida banker Brian Barnett. <clears throat> if anyone's from Florida, you will have heard or remembered Barnett Bank. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, in the 30s, Madeline and her family lived near Jacksonville. After getting married, she moved into a 200-year-old farmhouse. I mean, I'm already jealous, right? 200-year-old farmhouse called Crosswicks, and this still exists today. If you do a search on Google, you will be able to see pictures of this beautiful old home that Madeline had. Madeline was also inducted into the New York Writers Hall of Fame in 2011, and in 2013, I think this is so fun, a crater on Mercury was named after her. And with all of her time travel stuff, I just think that that's like perfect. It's just perfect. Um, she also um, wrote almost 50 books. So she was very busy, a very busy writer in her lifetime. All right, let's get to the summary. 
The summary of An Acceptable Time, Polly is staying with her grandparents, the parents in A Wrinkle in Time. The home is built at the intersection of ancient ley lines and some very sacred sites. A friend and bishop has been collecting and studying ogham stones. Now, I actually stopped and looked that up as well because I wanted to see, was this a real thing that she picked up from history and went running with, or, you know, was it something made up? Well, ogham stones are actually real things. You can Google that too. Okay, so the bishop somehow managed to open a time gate to 3,000 years ago, which Polly accidentally finds herself visiting as well. There are two different tribes, 3,000 years ago, that are in conflict over rain, and towards the end of the book, Polly the bishop and a friend of hers end up trapped in that 3,000 year ago time period, with one of the tribes wanting to sacrifice Polly to make it rain. It's a few days before they are able to return to their own time and restore said time properly. It really is kind of a cool book. All right, my opinion of this book. Now, as I said, I've not read the other three in between, so I can't comment on those and, and maybe how this book continues from that. I feel like this one, though, can stand on its own. Like I said, I am not, I've read the first one, have not read the third, and I feel like there really wasn't much that carried over into here. So if you haven't read the other ones, I think you can enjoy this one just fine without all that. I thought that it was very creative. Anything with time travel is interesting to me anyway. Um, back to the Ogums. I looked at the Ogum because I was curious about that. They are the earliest form of writing in Ireland and they date back to around the fourth century AD. They are a kind of Celtic tree alphabet. Look this up, go to Google. It, it's actually very interesting. I think it's really cool when even reading a fiction book that you get a little bit of real history. And when you pause and you go look it up and see what you can find, you find a bit of real history. Ogham stones were not something that I had ever heard of before. So it's something totally new from this. Okay, let's get into answering the questions. What do you think about the cover? What do I think about the cover? Well, it's a smaller book, as you can see, probably just this publication. And let me hold it so y'all can see. I thought the cover was fine. It caught my attention anyway. The colors are pretty, the images are pretty, and it kind of gives you, I don't know, enough to it that it makes you curious and you want to read it. And I have to say that the images alone really do reflect what is going on in the book because you have your main character here on the cover, her friend that comes into play later in the book, we'll talk about that. She's got a picture of here with a little heart on it, that is important. And then the two people that are over here on the side, those are also main characters of the story. And those are two that are coming from the 3000 year ago time period. So the cover is very pretty. Is the title an accurate representation of the story? Yes, I think the title is relatively accurate. Um, it has time in it, an acceptable time. And they jump back in time, so that's fine. I read after the fact, when I was doing a little bit of reading about Madeline and her faith and all that, that an acceptable time is actually part of a Bible quote. I'm trying to remember, I think they mention it in the book. I don't remember what page it's on, but I think it is actually mentioned in there. So yeah, pretty accurate. How original or unique was the story? I think it's very original and very unique. I am always, as I said, fascinated by time travel stories anyway. And the way that Madeline writes her stories, I just, I think she's brilliantly creative. 
especially with also adding in the real bits of history like she does. What did you like best and least? All right, what I liked best? Polly's open mind and her bravery when thrust 3,000 years into the past, I thought was incredible. She understood different cultures and how our, our tribal ancestors thought and dealt with them in ways that they could understand. I mean, let's face it, most of us would be panicking from the get-go, but she had learned so much. She had studied with her grandparents. She had talked with the bishop a little bit. She understood like oakum stones and kind of that <clears throat> uh, dialect, wh whatever you want to call that. And so she seemed to be in a way very comfortable in the other time period and with the other people. And she understood how a more primitive culture thinks and was able to work within that. Now, <clears throat> what I liked the least. <laughs> The part that I liked the least was her friend Zachary. This picture right here, that's Zachary. Now apparently he was in another book, either the book or two before this. So it was somebody that she had met previous. Now I don't know if I had read the other books with him in it, if it would make a difference one way or another in this one, probably not. Um, but he was awful. He was absolutely awful. I thought he was a very nice guy in the beginning and no. Um, he was just a bad person. He practically offered up Polly as a sacrifice to save himself. On top of that though, I kind of saw no point to his character in the story. The story would have been exactly the same without him in it even including the possible sacrificing part. And I say that because there were a couple other characters in that 3000 year ago time period that were looking at her in the same way. That is something that a primitive culture, not understanding weather and weather patterns and things like that, that, that was very common. They needed to pray to the God or gods or whatever for rain. And they felt like anytime that they needed help, needed rain, needed whatever it was that they needed, that they needed to sacrifice to appease the God, gods, whatever they're praying to, so that they can get what they need. So him, he, he basically, I'm not give, really giving anything away here. He had a heart problem in the story, a very serious heart problem. And he was wanting their healers to try to heal him. And I don't begrudge him that any of us would want that, you know, want to be healed, but he was willing to allow her to be sacrificed so that they would heal him. And like I said, it just did not add anything to the story because a couple other people were already looking at her. They looked at her because of some of her understanding of things and whatever. They looked at her like she was a goddess. They thought that she had special powers and they thought because she was so powerful that, oh, if we sacrifice her, maybe that'll make our God gods happy and we'll finally get the rain that we need. So we would have had that bit of the story without him. And so him coming in and just being a number one grade A jerk, it just, it, like I said, it did not add anything to the story and he was just awful. And so... <laughs> I liked him least of all. What feelings did the book evoke? The book, kind of aside from that bit about Zachary, really didn't uh, evoke anything dramatic in me. Zachary made me a little angry. <laughs> it did evoke that. Um, a few times there was some confusion when the time gate kept appearing because it seemed to be very random and nobody really knew why in the story. So that was a little confusing at first, kind of like, oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, we're 3000 years ago now. Okay, okay, all right, I got it. Um, there was some curiosity about the Ogham Stones. That was just my own curiosity. Like, oh, wait a minute, is this a real thing or is this a made up thing? So there was that. Um, also, when we got to the end, I actually got a little bit frustrated with it because when they get trapped 
3,000 years ago and when the whole bit with Zach, Zachary and his heart issue and her trying to be a possible sacrifice, at one point, I said there's two tribes that were in conflict. The one tribe got her. She ended up sort of on the other side. And the conversations and just the events that were taking place kind of during this time period, it was maybe over two or three days or something. It just kind of seemed to be a little repetitive. I got to the point where I was like, okay, look, are we going to sacrifice or not? Like <laughs> we've been going back and forth with this a little bit. Like we kind of need to need to move on. I wouldn't say that that took away from the story. Maybe that was just a personal preference of mine where I was kind of thinking, okay, okay. All right. I got this. I got this. Let's move on. All in all, I would say though, that it was all positive from the book. What is your favorite quote or part of the book? My favorite quote is, let's see. And it's when they were, there, there was, there was um, a bit of a fight that was going on. And the bishop, he says, suddenly the bishop began to sing to his voice quavering, but clear. Kyrie eleison, Christi eleison, Kyrie eleison. Not that that's a big quote, but when I read the Kyrie eleison, I, my 80s brain went, oh, there's a song. Oh, there's a song about that. Any 80s kids or older, if you think back, look up Mr. Mister. And they did a song that was, that the name of it was Kyrie. And translated, it basically is Lord have mercy. And so, like in the song, they're saying, um, Kiri lays on down the road that I must travel. And so it was, you know, Lord have mercy, basically like a protection. And so I thought that was kind of cool because it brought me back to the song, because I always love that song anyway. And it actually helped me understand that song a bit more because when it first came out, I didn't know what that meant. And I didn't have Google to look it up. So it was a cool song. I mean, I figured obviously that it had some particular meaning, but I didn't know what it was. So seeing it in here, I was like, oh yeah, the song, that's right. So that's when I looked that up and saw that the actual translation of that is Lord have mercy. And that is, it is a protection sort of thing. And so of course it made sense in the story. And then when I thought back to the song, it also made sense there. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, if you're not familiar with that song, go to Google, go to YouTube, type in Mr. Mister, and it's going to be M-R and then spelled out M-I-S-T-E-R and then Kyrie, which is K-Y-R-I-E. So look that up and then you'll hear that song. From what other character's point of view would you like to read? The other point of view. I would really like to read the bishop's point of view. He was the one that accidentally opened the time gate to start with. Uh, he met the people on the other side first. And so I think that reading about that discovery through his eyes, since he was the first one, I think that that would be fascinating. He had been um, finding these stones and collecting them and of course working on what they meant and all that. But I feel like since he was the first one that, that kind of crossed over his perspective, his thoughts, his fear, I mean, I don't know, his excitement. And when he met the people for the first time and the trying to communicate with them, yeah, I would like a chapter or two uh, on that. I think that would be pretty cool. What do you think was the author's purpose in writing the book? The author's purpose in writing the book. Well, I think most of it was um, to continue the story of the family from A Wrinkle in Time. Now, I don't know if when she did A Wrinkle in Time, if she set out to like if she had in her mind, oh, I'm going to continue, continue the story and have other books. I don't know. Um, but 
to continue that, I'm sure, was kind of the main thing. I think the other reason was to explore time travel in a different way than she'd done previously. I don't know if you've read A Wrinkle in Time, but there are, and there's also a couple movies out. I don't know if you've seen them, but there are three kind of celestial magical beings that help Meg, who's the main character of that book, time travel to different dimensions in order to find her father who had gotten trapped over there. So that story was showcasing time travel in a different way, whereas this one was much more, much more subtle. There were no, you know, magical celestial beings coming to help Polly. It was just I think somehow maybe because of those Ogham stones or because of the ley lines or the sacredness of where the house was sitting, there was something in there that was actually opening the time gate. So there was still time travel, but you've got two completely different ways. And so I think that since she did time travel in one way in that first book, she wanted to try something a little different in this one. Would you read another book from the same author? I absolutely would. This was my second book of Madeline's. I thoroughly enjoyed the first one. I very much enjoyed this one. And so now I actually want to go back and get the three that I've missed in the middle and read those. Would you recommend it to others and or would you read it again? I would absolutely recommend it and I would read it again for sure. You heard me say in the first video that I did that if I really enjoy a book, it's going up on the shelf. If I read a book and if I, it was just, eh, you know, it was just okay or you know, whatever, then I don't keep it. So anything that I keep is something that I would definitely read again. Well, that concludes this brew and review. Have you read any of Madeline's books? If you have, let me know. Let me know which one you read, which one you liked, or have you seen the movies? Um, I forget when the first one came out. The first one came out, gosh, I don't know, 20 some odd years ago, maybe. But then they recently, and I say recently, but it's probably been a few years as well, um, it had Oprah in it, it had Reese Witherspoon in it, and it, I think it had a couple others. I, I'm just forgetting off the top of my head, but the movie was pretty good. I thought it was a pretty good adaptation of the book. So let me know if you have seen that, and let me know what you're reading right now. Since I have finished this one, I'm already starting on another one. So can't wait to do the review for that one. As always, time is precious. Carpe diem, seize the day. I'll see you next time.